You do briefly set out the mainstream view in the speech and you say that the consensus, the mainstream current consensus in monetary thinking is increasingly untenable and you go on to say that it's increasingly anachronistic. So, do, do you, given the things that you've said here, do you, do you think it's possible to avoid a long-term fundamental structural change in the monetary regime? Uh, I... I think that there will be a change. I mean, it, now measured over measured over decades, um, it's very hard to predict exactly. That which is unsustainable tends to go on for longer than you think, and then happen more quickly uh, than you expect. To paraphrase Rudy Dornbush, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but uh, I, th I think that these structural uh, flaws, in the end, in the system will ultimately result in a change. And the rise of China, the relative rise of China, will also result in a change through these two forces. Um, and the question I'm trying to raise is, do we get ahead of that change, or do we help manage that change and, and affect some sort of rebalancing of the system? And to be absolutely clear, I'm, when I say we, I'm talking not about uh, you know, the, uh, I'm talking about the central banks, the public side as opposed to the private side coming up with an entirely different decentralized system. Mm -hmm. um, so this is partly where we may part company at that point uh, on, on the issue. I'm all in, in favor of, of choice. Yeah, exactly, in favor of choice, but uh, just to be clear. Thank you. So um, can I ask the other members of the panel if they share the governor's analysis in the speech? Because I feel confident you've probably read it. If you haven't, do say, because I wouldn't want to unfairly really on something you haven't read, but Dr. Haldane, do you, do you broadly share the, government, the governor's um, uh, Freudian slip then? I've, the read, it. Uh, I've read it um, twice, actually. Um, uh, and I do, yes. I mean, it's, um, I mean interestingly, I, I, I doubt there's very much strong pushback on the, on the diagnosis. Um, uh, this asymmetry has been here for quite some while, since, at least since the breakdown of uh, Bretton Woods. Um, I agree with uh, the governor that uh, those tensions have become more acute. Uh, of late, um, as many economies have become in some ways more dollarized, at least in terms of the debt that they uh, debt that they issue, there's no question that the uh, the one solutions and, and 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 the governor floated one in his speech, um, the synthetic hegemonic uh, currency. It just trips off the tongue, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. That's another three letter acronym. <laughs> um, uh, is definitely towards the ambitious end of the spectrum, but that is just this, now is the time for ambition on these on these big issues. So, broadly speaking, I, I very much kind of share the diagnosis. Thank you. May, may I ask? Can I ask the other two panelists yeah. the first to come in, please? Just very quickly, I, I'm very supportive of what was said. It's a hard nut to crack because, as the governor says in his speech, you know these network effects are very strong. When everybody is using one currency, then there's an incentive for everybody else to use the same currency. So. Um, that's a hard thing. That's a hard nut to crack. But uh, I share Andy yeah, Holden's well, view that now's the time Ten to be Ten years I've been ambitious. banging on about the international financial system. And it is, <laughs> it's going to change. But here we are. We're making progress. Dr. Flager, what would you like to add on the government's speech? Um, so I, I made the same point about the, uh, the impact on the global economy of an asymmetric tightening in the U.S. when the rest of the world is not doing as well. I made that in the beginning of the year. Uh, as being a, a, a key source of the tensions that we've seen um, just in the most recent slowdown, adding uh, on top of the uh, on top of the trade war, um, I don't really have anything to add on the long-term solution to this. But um, you know, it's it's one of the things that we take into account when we evaluate the strength of the global economy. So I'll, the government wants to come back, yeah, and I'll, I'll work to wrap up. I'll make a quick point, if I may, which is, and I want to link it back because you rightly started off on taking a step back, looking medium, longer term. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things we've tried to do as a bank is to step back and think about, okay, where's the financial system going? Um, we talked earlier about SMEs, but the payment system itself, um, and how can that be improved? There's a variety of ways that uh, it is being improved, and there's others, but one of the issues, which is links back to the speech, is uh, whether or not there are going to be central bank digital currencies. Um, uh, in order for there to be instantaneous, costless payments domestically um, and potentially cross-border, uh, which would be to the benefit of citizens and businesses, and particularly small and medium-sized businesses, but all businesses. And the question is whether if that, if, could, could that happen? And the answer is yes, it could happen, in fact. 
Mr. Holliday is helping to lead our efforts in thinking about how the various ways, and there's more than one way you could do it and various avenues to do it. Um, but the question is, if you do have that happen, um, does it make sense to do it on a coordinated uh, fashion with uh, some of the core central banks, which brings benefits in and of itself from a cross-border perspective, but happens to be a component of a more seamless rebalancing of uh, how transactions are priced. Because, and I'll finish with this, it's not just about the financial spillovers, although those are incredibly important, and they're one of the reasons why the equilibrium interest rate is so low, and Dr. Gallegan in another speech pointed out that why the left-hand tail risk is higher. Um, but it's the fact that a disproportionate uh, amount of real transactions, purchases of goods and services, are priced in U.S. dollars, even when the two countries have nothing to do with the U.S. They're not, they don't touch the U.S. Um, and as more and more activity moves online, the question is, what is the currency of choice online? Um, and could the currency of choice online be better balanced between a basket of central bank digital currencies, uh, which is not a new currency, but is a back-to-back -back of those? And that's the question on the table. So I think if I were to sort of pick up what to me is the highlight of what we've heard, you've explained in the long term, and I think I should emphasize to those watching, it's in the long term that we've got a system which is unsustainable and cannot go on, will go on longer than anyone expects and then will change faster than anyone expects. It feels to me like that in such a moment of change globally, we'll need leadership from a global institution, Dr. Haldane, won't we? What kind of institution might provide such global leadership on monetary reform in such circumstances? Where should we look for leadership? to move this conversation forward for the whole world? Well, I mean, there are a number of international financial institutions who are charged with thinking about just these questions. Uh, and you know their names. Um, some of them are also a three-letter acronym. Um, uh, but I hope within that, uh, and, and Mark is very much um, in the forefront of our efforts as an institution to put ideas on the table for reforming all of these things. Uh, London and the UK, uh, still uh, is home to uh, one of, if not the world's biggest global financial centre. Um, we have, over the years, as an institution, given huge amounts of thought uh, to redesign the international monetary system. Uh, and I hope we can continue very much uh, in, uh, in that vein. So um, uh, we, I hope, would be among others in I'm, helping so lead the can charge. I save you? because I'm very confident you will be amongst those, but I'm also confident that the IMF will be amongst them. And I am not promise I won't press you too far on this, but the journalists watching will know where I'm coming from and will have looked at my Twitter feed. I feel confident and will now. Do you think that the IMF should be led by a politician, or do you think it should be led <laughs> by somebody who really understands these issues in detail and can articulate what should be done in order to address <laughs> these kind of root causes? Is that a question for me, Mr Baker? <laughs> I think I've made my point for those watching, but I wish you well. 